morning, church family. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Good to be in church with you all. Listen, we are in the First Things series. We've been doing this since the first of the year where we heard our lead pastor, Josh Finley, sharing. And we've had kind of a, a nice mix here, a little potpourri during this series. We had uh, Pastor Brad, our, our creative arts pastor, share the second week. And last week, you guys got to hear from the Reverend Gary Ham, who's a, a friend of Elam and friend of this church, uh, share. And this morning, you get to hear from me sharing about the supernatural power of serving. Uh, Michelle and I, we just got back from a cruise this week, so I, not to uh, get you guys fantasizing about being on vacation right now, but hey, it's, we had like a 50 degree weekend this weekend, so we kind of, we brought some warmth back with us. You guys are welcome. And the cool thing is that we actually went on this cruise kind of spontaneously because one of you, a congregant here at the church, decided to gift Michelle and I with a cruise before Christmas. So right a few days before Christmas. Oh yeah, it's incredible. A few days before Christmas, we had this spontaneous conversation with, hey, we want to send you guys on a cruise. And by the way, it's in three weeks. We were like, wow, okay, well, let's see what we can do. And God just put all the pieces together and we were able to be able to go this past week and just have an absolute blast. And I have to say, there is nothing quite like preparing a sermon, sitting on a balcony overlooking the ocean, Hearing the birds, you know, flying by, trying to catch their lunch, and the waves against the ship. It was, it was pretty nice. I'll try to do that a little more often if I can. I work on that. It was kind of this running joke that Michelle and I had throughout the whole cruise, because you're on this boat with over 3,000 people, right? They're all there. They've paid to be on this boat, and we're on this cruise together. But then... In addition to the 3,000 that are there, there's another 1,000 people that are there as employees taking care of you. So yeah, that's right. There is like one employee on the ship for every three people that are there as guests. And so they're just all over the place, and they are taking care of you like crazy. And in particular, we really felt the housekeeping, the service that the housekeeping was giving us. And we were, I'm, I'm not kidding, the housekeeping came to our room probably five times a day. You know, when you're in a hotel, you guys know, you're lucky if they come and, like, change out your towels and at least fix your bed, right? But this was a whole different level of housekeeping going on. And I remember about halfway through the cruise, we had stayed up late the night before watching this show that they had on the ship. And so it was, like, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and our, our housekeeping guy came by, and he's checking, hey, is everything okay? Do you guys need any fresh towels? Do you need anything? No, we're all set. Thank you. Glad you guys did that at 10 o'clock this morning. Good to see you again at 2, but we're all set. And, okay, okay, if you need anything, let us know. So he leaves probably a half hour later, hanging out in the room, and I start getting a little tired, and I'm thinking, I'm on vacation. I'm going to take a nap right now. Like, this is, this is napping time. So you open up the balcony door. You got to hear the waves. You know, you don't have to put it, like, on the app on your phone. It's actually real. Like, it's really happening. And I'm laying down, and I'm just, uh, it's just wonderful. And then I'm just starting to doze off into sleep, and I hear a, on the door again, and I'm like, uh, hello, hey, housekeeping, housekeeping, uh, is there anything I can get you? Do you need anything? And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. All right, you guys are here again. I'm like, no, thank you, we're all set. Okay, sir, just want to make sure you're sure you don't need any towels, or how's your, how's your room? Is there anything I can get you? No, nope, just looking for a little peace and quiet, thank you, like, appreciate you. Okay, okay, if you need anything, let me know. Then he closes the door and proceeds to uh, vacuum the hallway, you know, while he's, he's out in the hallway. So gave up on the nap. But it was so crazy because it was almost annoying how much they were taking care of you, right? Like the service they were giving. But you actually couldn't get upset with them because they were so nice. Like every time you interact with them, you're like, man, you're so nice. You are nice two hours ago. You're nice now. You're going to be nice in a couple hours when you stop by again. It was really cool. And, of course, they're working, you know, they're doing their job their best. They're, they're wanting to, to serve well and, and uh, you know, do what their managers are asking them to do with their job. And also, you know, they're looking for some tips from us guests. And so we made sure we took care of our, our housekeeper who was so diligent. Uh, but God's design for us serving each other and for service is so much deeper than even what we experienced on that cruise. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. And the, the primary, the first thing I want to share with you is that the, the biggest expression that we can have in life is love. And God actually designed love to be attached and expressed 
most fully in an atmosphere of giving. Isn't that incredible? He could have created love to be expressed in any way he wanted, but to express love most fully, it needs to be in an environment of giving. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. So even in the heart of the Father, his love toward us is intimately connected with his service, his willingness to give to us. And so that means that the love that God has given you as a child of God for the people in your circle, for the people in your life, for your other brothers and sisters in Christ, cannot be fully expressed until you step out and are willing to serve them. And what I mean by serve them is I mean to give yourself to another for their benefit. To give something of yourself to another for their benefit. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Mark 10, 45 is such a key scripture. This is the words of Jesus here. And he says this. He says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is such a powerful scripture because Jesus has always been King of Kings. He has always been Lord of Lords. He's always had a throne in heaven to rule and reign from. But when he came to earth as a man, he chose to lay all of that aside and he chose to first serve us. Before we could do anything for him, before we deserved it, he chose to serve us first. And that might not look like a huge deal because if you look at the life of Jesus, he did a lot of amazing things, right? But let's think about that for a minute. If you know Jesus at all, maybe you've read the Gospels or you've studied his life and you want to model your life after his like, like we do as disciples of Christ. You know all the good things he did, the teachings that he had, the revelation that he had about the word of God and the way he healed people supernaturally. All the wonderful things that he did in his life. We take his whole life and then all you do is take out that one piece in Mark 10, 45, the cross. That one act of service. Just take that out of Jesus' life. Every, we'll take everything else. What do you have left? Well, I'll tell you one thing. You have a great man, a great teacher. You still have the Son of God. But you, don't, you no longer have the Savior of the world. We no longer have the gift of salvation. We no longer have resurrection life available to us that can be living inside of us and flowing through us. We no longer have power to overcome the enemy of our souls. That is how important Jesus' service was to us. Because he was willing to serve us in that way, the power in Jesus' story comes from his willingness to serve. And so I want to share this morning about how you and I can be a little bit more like Christ in our lives, in our acts of service. And to do that, we're going to get into the Word a little bit this morning so you can get out your Bibles or your phones or however you get into the Scripture. And I want to look at a very ordinary person in the, bottle, in, the, in the Bible who models such an extraordinary service for us. We're going to be in the book of 2 Kings. So that's in the Old Testament. We have First and Second Samuel, then First and Second Kings. We're going to be in chapter 5. You guys getting there? Second Kings chapter 5. We're going to start right in verse 1. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. We'll have those verses up on the screen for you if you prefer to read along that way. Starting in verse 1, this is what it says. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. That's a, a debilitating skin disease that had no cure. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. I want to stop right there in the story because having a little bit of historical context here is going to help you catch the power of this story. Now, Aram is this uh, territory in, in uh, ancient times. It was this territory that was found to the north of Israel. So you have Israel and then you have to the north. It was literally a bordering land to, to the nation of Israel. And Israel and Aram, as you read throughout the, the Old Testament, they were in constant intermittent conflict. They were battling back and forth for territory, taking villages and, from one another along that border. And there are times where you see that uh, Aramean, uh, the Arameans come and actually declare war against Israel. There's times where 
Aramean soldiers are hired by other kings to attack Israel for them. And so there's this constant tension in this relationship between these bordering nations. And there's another layer to that conflict because actually the land of Aram, where the Arameans existed, was actually the birthplace of Abraham. It was actually the place where the origin of the nation of Israel was. So you hear the land of Ur, and you hear about the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Those are all in the land of Aram. So this is also where Isaac, Abraham's son Isaac, and his son Jacob, they went to Aram to actually find their wives and start their families. And so there was this connection, this deep connection to Israel's history in the land of Aram. And so you had this conflict happening. It was actually over very sacred ground to Israel. And so the Arameans are controlling this land, and you see Naaman, the commander of the Aramean army, he's, he's taken some territory here, taken some land from Israel, and taken some people captive. And so in the middle of this deep-seated conflict between these nations and these peoples, we have this backdrop for this story. And as the Arameans had come and taken some Israelites captive, among them was this little girl. And we don't know the little girl's story in scripture, but my guess is that she, either her family was killed or she was taken from her family. She was brought into Naaman's house and she was held there as a slave, really, as a captive to be the servant to Naaman's wife. And so here's this girl taken from her home, taken from her family, brought into service in Naaman's home. She had every right to be frustrated, angry, and bitter at Naaman and his family for what had happened to them. I think she could have looked at his leprosy and the condition that he had and said, serves you right. You deserve that because of what you've done to me and my family. But instead of choosing what I think would be normal for myself or any of us in that situation, she chose to respond differently. And I want to look at that this morning. We're going to see how her simple, profound act of service changed everything for Naaman and his family. So we're going to continue reading in this passage, 2 Kings 5. We're going to skip down to verse 9. I'll just catch you up a little bit with this passage. Naaman tells the king about what this little girl had said, that maybe there was someone who could heal him. And so he gets sent out to go to the king of Israel. And he, he basically shows up with his chariots and with his men and with his gold. And he says, I am here for my healing, king of Israel. And the king of Israel says, uh, I think you have the wrong guy. That's, I'm not the guy that can do that for you. I think you're looking for Elisha. He was a little nervous about that interaction. He says, okay, I want to send you over to the prophet Elisha. And that's who the little servant girl was talking about that could heal him. So here in verse 9, we see Naaman kind of pulling up with his entourage to the house of Elisha. And it says this, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. I just love the little side note here where Naaman didn't actually even get to tell his story about why he was there. The Lord sort of had a plan already in place. It already talked to Elisha. Elisha had the response. But look at how, how Naaman responds in verse 11. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farper, aren't they better than any of the rivers in Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? Can't you almost hear him like stamping his foot while he's saying this? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him, and they said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. He finally saw reason. Went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child's, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, this is Elisha, and they, Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Isn't that an incredible story? I love that we got this full picture in the Bible, this full description of what happened to Naaman and what he experienced, because I want to pull out for you this morning three things Naaman experienced as a result of the Israelites' girls' service to him. 
The first thing that he experienced was that Naaman was humbled. Naaman was humbled. See, the little servant girl, she knew something about her master. She knew he had this skin condition, that it was, it was oppressive to him, that it was something that was chronic and it was never going to go away except for the intervention of God. She knew that he needed a physical healing. But God actually knew the full story, and he knew that Naaman needed something even greater than his physical healing. See, Naaman was sick on the outside of his body, but he also had a sickness on the inside of his body and his heart called pride. And God could see the pride that the Israelite girl couldn't see. And so when he came and Elisha gives him such a simple instruction, Elisha doesn't even go out to meet him. He actually sends his servant to give him the instructions. It so insulted Naaman's pride that he literally threw a temper tantrum in Scripture, didn't he? He was angry. He was just throwing this tantrum. So he just manifested this pride that he had in his life. And even the men around him who honored him and served him looked at it and they said, Naaman, this isn't right. He's not asking. He didn't send you away and say, no, I refuse to heal you. He actually gave you simple instructions. And you're so proud that you don't want to even follow the simplest of instructions. You want to do it your way. And even though Naaman, this is what I love about God, even though Naaman was a worshiper of false gods, he did not worship the God of heaven. Even in that state, God was so invested in Naaman that he was willing to expose to him a wall that he had in his heart that was going to keep him from God. And so in that state, he, God was orchestrating a situation in Naaman's life for him to say, wow, I have this pride in my heart, and I need to humble myself if I'm going to receive something supernatural from this God that I know nothing about. And so we see this happening. that The Lord exposes this wall and allows Naaman to come and be humbled to be able to receive what God has for him. And this is the application for you and I. When we serve, it opens the door for others to experience God in a new way. See, it's really awesome that when you serve someone, you're meeting a felt need for them, right? And I think it's also a blessing that we feel good in response when we actually give out and serve. That's not selfish. I think that's actually a good thing. It's positive feedback. But there's actually more going on than just us meeting the practical need or us feeling good about what we're doing the Holy Spirit is actually backing our play. He's actually doing something that we can't do ourselves in this situation. And this is what we see in Naaman's life. The second thing, we see he was humbled. We see the second thing, that Naaman was healed. And the beautiful thing here is that when he was confronted with his pride, and he was willing to turn and see reason and humble himself and do what God required. His humility led to his healing. So here he is, this man, dealing with this physical condition, his skin, for years. And just like that, in a moment, he no longer had to deal with that limitation that he had in his life. And that is the cool thing about partnering with God and serving, is that he does things that we could never do for other people. And we just step out and make that small, that small step of obedience to do what he's asking us to do. Because when we do what we can do, the little, sometimes it looks so little, so small, the little things that we can do, God turns around and will supernaturally do what only he can do. And we are actually just opening that door for God to go into another's life and supernaturally transform them. It's not on us to be their savior. It's not on us to be their healer. It's on us to facilitate opening that door and allowing the Lord into another's life. And that leads us to the third thing. Naaman was humbled. Naaman was healed. And probably the most important thing that happened to him in this story, Naaman was reconciled to God. See, the, I was just said in a moment ago, the Arameans were idol worshipers. They were polytheists, which means they had many gods that they worshipped. And in the scripture here, in this passage, it says that Naaman worshipped the god Rimon, which most historians will say is actually Baal. Uh, it's just another name for Baal, who Baal was looked at as the king of the gods in a polytheistic culture. And so he's, he's worshiping this, this idol, this demon, really. And, and he's standing there worshiping this, this god, and that's his culture. That's what he grew up in. That's what his family did. That's what he knew to be right, right? 
And on top of that, think about this. He is the commander of the army that is fighting against killing and taking captive Israelites, whose God is the Lord. So culturally, in his family, in his history, in even the way that he approaches the Israelites, everything in him says, I'm not going to receive this God of Israel. But what happens when he gets confronted with the kindness of God? His entire history gets wiped out. All of the reasoning, all of the logic, all of the excuses and the explanations go out the door And he says, I've met a God in Israel that is greater than any God I can imagine. And his kindness has met me. He's healed me from this disease sovereignly. And Naaman knew that he had never worshipped this one true God before. He knew that. So why would this one true God come who I've never worshipped before and heal me and do something for me that is so kind and so loving? And so that's where we see Naaman in verse 15 saying, now I know that there is no other God in all the world except the God in Israel. That is incredible. That is incredible. That is a life transformed. And in that culture, it's a very patriarchal culture. So when the father of that household says, there is no other God except the God in Israel, I'm telling you what, the spouse, the children, the grandchildren, everyone is going to know that there is no true God except the the God of Israel. Everyone's going to know that. And so now you have this family being transformed because Naaman became a worshiper of God. So what was the catalyst to Naaman's transformation? How did he get there? A small, seemingly insignificant Israelite girl that God sowed into his household who cared more about the wholeness of her master than in her less than ideal circumstances. That, to me, is a very convicting story. This little girl shows me more about a picture of Christ than I often see in my own life. And it's such a convicting story because it's so close to the heart of the Father to serve. And listen, church, you can be a good person. You can be a kind person to others. You can be a wise person the way you make choices, a loving person but you will never fully see the impact of your, that your life can have on others until you step out and you are willing to take a risk and serve them. When it's no longer about you and you actually want more for the person than you want from them and you're willing to step out and give a little bit of yourself to another person for their benefit, it unlocks the supernatural potential in your walk with the Lord. And that's why serving is less about how busy or not busy we are, whether it fits into the convenience of our schedule, and it's actually more about just being a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ and doing what he did. Because Christ, through this audacious act of service, Mark 10, 45, we read it, he reconciled mankind back to God through the cross. One act, all of us in this room were reconciled back to God. How incredible is that? He took that hole of sin that separated us from the Father, the poor choices that we have made to walk away from him and our worship of him and to honor him. And Jesus said, that's not okay. And God sent him to the earth to serve us by laying his life down to fill that hole in so that we could walk across his redemption to a relationship with the Father. And just like this Israelite girl She was serving a man who was her enemy. Naaman was her enemy, and she was serving him. Jesus served us while we were yet sinners. Before we could do anything for him, before we could love him the way that he deserved, he died for us. So do you think this is a big deal to the Father? And this is the beautiful part, church. In the New Testament, it talks about how God has given us, the family of God, his children, the ministry of reconciliation. He's given that to us. What does that mean? That means that we, it's not our job to be a savior for another person. It's not our job to rescue them or carry their weight. It is our job to lead them to the one who has already given them all things. 
That's what the ministry of reconciliation is, is taking two parties and bringing them together. And when you decide, I'm going to step out and serve, and I'm going to try to make my life look more like Christ than it has in the past, I'm going to serve others for their benefit. What you're doing is you're saying, person I'm serving, here's Jesus. Jesus, person I'm serving. And it might be a small little thing, insignificant. You're opening the door for someone when they walk into church. You're leading a small group or hosting it in your house. You're going into the kids' rooms during the service, and you're, you're not in here with the adults. You're in playing with the kids and ministering to them. And you think, what is this doing? This is nothing. But I'm telling you right now, God will not be mocked. Those acts of service have supernatural power behind them. And when you serve another person that way, you are bringing them in proximity with the God of the universe. And I'm telling you, when you're in proximity with the God of the universe, you have no choice but to be transformed. Amen? Amen. Church, are you willing to be like Christ and invest in others through your acts of service? Listen, as we close this morning, I want to do something special. I really believe in this. I believe in the power of serving other people. And I've seen this function so much in my own life. And, you know, I, I was thinking about it when I was preparing that, um, you know, I'm someone who have a prophetic gift, and I like to be able to share with people what God's saying about them and how he has hope over their life and a destiny for them and a future. And I got thinking back to the first time that I ever remember giving a word to somebody that was from God. And it was probably within a few months of when we started coming to this church. It's like in 2003. And Michelle and I decided we're going to jump in. We're going to serve with the youth ministry, with the teenagers. And we did that. We served, and we were there. And we just happened one night to be at this leaders meeting. So all the other volunteers who were serving with the youth were there hanging out, just having a meal together and doing some planning for the year. And while we're sitting there, I just saw this other couple, and I thought, man, I feel like God wants to say something to them. And I just want to pray for them. And Shell and I went over, we prayed for them. And I didn't even really know what I was going to pray or what was going to happen. But I ended up basically telling them exactly where their relationship was at, what God was doing in their relationship, and how they could take this opportunity to receive what he was doing. And it was like, they were just kind of like, okay, what just happened? Like, we don't even really know this guy that well. And he's like reading our mail. And I just looked at that and I went, wow, God, I would have never had that opportunity to even discover what was inside of me if I wasn't sitting in that room because I decided that I was going to serve. So I decided I was willing to step out and give a little of myself to other people. And I know that as you step out and you serve, you're going to see God do amazing things through you, but he's also going to start showing you what he's doing in you to make you more like him. So the biggest lie that you can tell yourself right now is that your contribution doesn't matter. And I hope you understand that from what I've shared you, with you in the Word this morning that it really, really does. And it, right practically in this room and, and in this our campuses and Henrietta and here in Lima, and if you're watching online, we have hundreds of people. I mean, just look around the room right now, just in this service, the people that are here. God needs you. Not because he needs you to toil for him or anything like that. He needs your acts of service. He needs you to be like Christ to your circle, to the people around you, to this church family. And when you take your little drop in that ocean of need and you allow yourself to be dropped in, you allow yourself to sow service into this church family, into this community, when we come together and do that, I'm telling you, there's something more significant that can happen, something huge supernatural, the impact in this region could be so powerful. We could transform this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ if we jumped on to serve and give what we have to others. Are you guys ready to say yes? Listen, if you're, this is not a, um, we have some service hosts. I'm going to, I'll welcome the service hosts if they're ready to go. I asked some service hosts to be ready because as a church leader, it would be wrong for me to preach a message like this and then not give you an opportunity to respond to what God is speaking to you. And we have uh, these little cards called test drive cards. And what they are is they're your, your front door to being able to serve 
and volunteer here at the church. And maybe it's uh, serving in one of the many areas we have going on on a Sunday morning or in a small group. We have a lot of opportunities that are available. So don't, don't feel like there's only one or two things and you might not be good at them. There are a lot of opportunities. And what I want to do is if you are currently, we have a number of people that serve regularly at our church, and this, this is not for you. But for those of us who are saying, you know, I call this my church home, but I want to be able to find an opportunity and see if there's something available for me to be able to step in and serve. Right now, I just want you to be bold and put your hand up so that our ushers can just give you a test drive card. Put one in your hand. Go ahead right now. Don't be shy. Put your hand up. We want to hand these out. This is not, you raising your hand is not you saying, yep, I'm going to start serving next Sunday and never stop serving for the rest of my life. This is actually the front door to you having an opportunity. So put your hands up. Receive one of these test drive cards. And really what that is, as you look at it, it's got different areas of our church that you can serve. And it's just got little boxes on there you can check if you're interested. There might be one or two of them or three of them even that kind of catch your eye that you think might fit with your personality, with your gift mix. And you can write those down and your information. And then what we do is we have the leader of that ministry contact you, they'll follow up with you, and they'll say, hey, let's let's figure out a time or two that you can come and you can serve in this area and see if you like it. That's why it's called a test drive. So you can go, you can serve a couple times, and then we'll follow up with you and say, hey, what did you think of that? Was it what you thought it was going to be? Do you, do you feel like it's a good fit? If it's not a good fit, then we can move you on to another area of interest for you and try out again. If it is a good fit, we can schedule the times that you want to be able to serve that fit with your uh, calendar and with what you have going on with your family. So this is a great front door opportunity. And what I want to encourage you to do right now is as we're closing the service, get out a pen, get out a pencil, just check that thing off quick, put your information on it. And when we close the service, there are boxes at all the exits. You can go ahead, fold it up, drop it in the boxes, and we'll make sure that they get to the right people. So in doing this, I feel like and my heart was just overflowing. I'm being the Henrietta campus pastor and having a, a literal church that we just launched and with folks from this church who have just been serving so faithfully there and here in Lima, the people that have, have been serving here and just providing these fantastic experiences for us at church and just some of the people that came to my mind, like, like Glenn and Sandy Marino, who have spent 12 years on praying for people, ministry and healing. Jim and Sue Richardson, in Henrietta, serving in kids ministry and first impressions. The George family, Peter and Amy and their kids, they serve as a family together. They serve it, and the Henrietta setup crew, and they serve at first impressions. Jonathan and Nikki Bergio, you saw Jonathan up here this morning, serving on worship team and as service MCs. Mike and Natalie Fabretti, serving as small group leaders. Samuel Rivera, serving at the Open Door Mission, the, serving the homeless of our city. Melissa Smith in our kids' ministry, Bill and Lori Phillips on the prophecy team and praying for people, God's heart over there. Mike and Christine Shutrup, elders and small group leaders. Elijah Ball, he was up here this morning and banging away at the drums, worshiping Jesus on the worship team. And for them and so, so many others, scores of other people who serve here faithfully and commit their heart to what God has for them. Can we just give them a huge hand right now? So I just want to personally thank you this morning for taking that step of courage and saying, you know what, I want, to join, I want to join that group of people, and I want to be more like Christ in the way that I serve. Would you all stand with me? Make sure you drop those test drive cards off in the boxes on the way out. If you didn't get a chance to pick up one and you want one, they, they're at Next Steps. You can stop out there in the lobby and get them. But there's one more thing that I want to do before we close the service. Anytime we gather, Jesus is here. And I couldn't possibly talk about serving today without bringing up our Lord and Savior and what he's done for us. And you might be in the room this morning and say, man, I have been able to receive that gift of salvation in my heart, and it has changed everything for me. I'm so grateful that Jesus chose to serve me first. But I know in a, in a gathering like this and online, there are people who are saying, you know, I don't think I've ever experienced fully what it means to receive Jesus and receive salvation and receive real love and life. 
And I want to be able to pray for you because that's the starting point of a journey with God. And I'm telling you, it changed everything for me. I've seen it change everything for so many people in my life, and it will change everything for you for the better. And so I want to pray. And would you all just bow your heads with me as we commit this time to the Lord? Father, I just thank you for your presence in this room. We acknowledge you, Lord, that without you, this is just a, a nice speech and nice songs that we sing and hanging out with friends. But Lord, when you're here, it changes the atmosphere. And we hear your voice and you change our thinking and you change our hearts and you warm us to your love and to your forgiveness. Lord, as we've heard from your word about serving this morning, I thank you for those who are taking those steps to engage more fully with serving and seeing what you can do with their steps of obedience. But Father, this morning, as we talked about the cross and we talked about who you are, a loving, kind Father who forgives us for sin that we couldn't ever earn, I just thank you right now, Father, that this prayer is as simple as it gets for us to join a relationship with you. Father, I don't want to live my own life anymore. I don't want to live a life of sin and deal with the mistakes and the regrets that I have anymore. I want to live a new life, and I look at the gift that you gave me on the cross, Jesus, and I want to receive that for myself. And as I do, I ask you to come, Jesus, and be Lord of my life, transform me from the inside out and allow me to know what it's like to be fully alive and to love like you love. Thank you, Father, for giving us this tremendous gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.